Good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you very much for letting me speak at your event. Fantastic. So, um, yeah, hello, everyone. My name is Daniel Venard, and I'm the, a Global Sustainability Director at Mars Incorporated. And I'm going to spend the next 15 to 20 minutes really doing three things. First of all, sharing our approach to sustainability at Mars. Then I'm going to share with you some of the activities that we're doing and specifically talk about the financial benefits that we're creating as well. And then thirdly, I'm going to end with some lessons that we learned that hopefully will be useful as uh, you, we go on the journey of Origin Green. Now, for those of you that don't know Mars, we're more than just the Mars bar. Um, as well as being the world's largest chocolate company, we're the world's largest pet food company, chewing gum company, and we've also got a number of big food brands and coffee and tea brands, and there's just a selection of our billion dollar brands up here. We're in 74 countries, we have about 72,000 associates, which is what we call our employees, and we generate about 33 billion uh, in net sales every year. And we're still owned by the founding family, the Mars family. And from the perspective of sustainability, that's brilliant, because it really enables us to think in terms of generations, not just in quarterly returns. And uh, the Mars family has really built a principles-led business. Um, and uh, if I just share with you here, these are our five core principles. And they really are core to the organization. They're core to our culture, and they're core to our decision-making. And there's one in particular that I want to share with you today. And that's the middle one, uh, mutuality. And just to bring it to life, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read to you excerpts from a letter that was written by one of the Mars family, Forrest Mars Senior, in 1947, where he talks about this principle and how central it is to us. So in this letter that we found in the archives about five, ten years ago, um, the original one, um, but uh, we keep referring to, um, within it he says, the company's objective is to manufacture and distribute products in a manner as to promote a mutuality of benefit. This expresses the total purpose of the company and nothing less. Now, he sent that to all of our employees in 1947, and I think that's pretty impressive because what he's saying is, in order for our business to be successful, we need to ensure success of all of the stakeholders across our supply chain. Now, clearly, whilst uh, um, uh, that was written in 1947, our business has changed, and importantly, so has the world. And as we've heard today from Jason and many others, um, the world in which we operate is facing some particular issues, some problems. What we call at Mars, and uh, Noam Rumbyview will use this language as well, the grand challenges. And in summary, for those that we are particularly concerned about is, how do we preserve the environment for future gener generations? How do we spread prosperity and growth more universally? And how do we feed more than 7 billion people whilst also addressing issues such as obesity? And driven by our purpose and driven by our values, we really feel that we have a responsibility to work in this area, to apply our concept of mutuality to not only our direct employees and our direct sourcing partners, but also broader to society and the planet, to use the scale that we've generated over the years and the freedom that our private ownership uh, offers us to make a real difference to people and planet. Now, clearly, this is a, this is a big old task, um, as, as many of you, I'm sure, are finding as well. So what we've done is we've chunked our work down into three key buckets. First of all, sourcing the raw materials that we buy. Secondly, our operations, so our factories and offices and how we can make them sustainable. And lastly, our brands. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to talk to you about a couple of examples or one or two examples in each area just to bring to life what we're doing and how we're approaching it. So let me, uh, let me just jump into sourcing. And uh, what I want to do is I want to bring to life our sourcing work uh, through the story of what we're doing in Cocoa. Now, for those of you that may have just eaten our chocolate bars or any other chocolate bars um, and have seen the word cocoa, um, you may not have seen the cocoa pod. And this is the cocoa pod here. Um, about five to six million farmers grow it around the world. And in many countries that are facing critical social, uh, socioeconomic issues, such as uh, Vietnam, the Philippines, and Cote d'Ivoire. And the farmers who grow this uh, work very hard um, to earn a living. And um, I suppose... However, uh, their incomes and their yields have really stagnated and in some places declined over the years. Their farms often need severe rehabilitation. Uh, they have aging trees. They have depleted soil. They have pests and diseases that are often on the rise. And they have um, uh, un undependable rainfall as well. 
So we're finding that a number of farmers are often looking at their cocoa uh, plantations and asking them themselves the question, is this a viable crop for me to be in? Is this something that's going to sustain my income, sustain my livelihood, sustain my life, but also sustain that of my children and the next generation of my family? And unfortunately, we're finding them often saying no to that, either moving to different crops or in the case of the younger generation, not moving into cocoa farming at all, or even moving out of farming and moving into urban industries. And so <clears throat> um, this, is a, this is a real problem for us, um, because at the other end of the spectrum, we're seeing increased demand for chocolate. And as a result, by 2020, we predict that the chocolate industry is going to be under real pressure. We think that demand will outstrip supply by a million tonnes per year, which for perspective is the amount produced by the biggest single origin in the world, Cote d'Ivoire. So a significant problem for us and a significant problem for farmers around the world. So what's the problem? How can we resolve this? Well, we believe the answer lies in mutuality specifically around productivity. Because we think that if we can help farmers become more productive, that in turn, they will produce higher yield, they'll earn higher incomes, and they'll produce the supply which we need to grow within industry. So how are we doing this? There's a couple of key pillars to our approach. First of all, scientific research. Scientific research is a key component of how we approach sustainability at Mars. So we're doing a number of things. First, in the, in, in the 80s, we established a cocoa development center in Brazil where we help learn the best cultiva cultivation techniques. We also learn and understand what are the best variants as well uh, for farmers to grow. But recently, um, we've also partnered with the USDA and IBM to help map the cocoa genome. What we've done is we've helped sequence and map the cocoa genome, but then we've released that, we've open sourced it, so that many scientists around the world can go on a database, understand the genomic sequence, identify variants that are more pest resistant and also have higher yields, that in turn they can develop the seeds and help distribute them to people around the world, much in the way that Jason uh, Clay was talking about earlier, uh, something that we need to do. However, if we just develop this technology and keep it in a, in a special box hidden away, it's clearly going to have no impact. So the second key thing for us is technology transfer. What we're doing is we're developing what we call a hub and spoke model. So in many of the rural communities we operate, we're developing community development centers and community village centers, where we're taking this knowledge, we're bringing farmers in, and we're uh, disseminating. In the Côte d'Ivoire, which is one of our major origins, we've now reached 150,000 farmers, and we're finding that people who go to these centres learn about how to uh, apply the best um, growing techniques and get fertiliser can increase their yield from 0.5 to 1.5 uh, tonnes per hectare. And then lastly, certification. We see certification as an important scalable model that we can apply across the industry that has some key social, environmental, and also increasingly productivity uh, practices that we think are critical for the industry. But also to some of the conversations earlier, we don't just want to apply this selectively. We've committed back in 2009, by 2020, all of our cocoa will be 100% certified. We're working with a series of partners that you can see up there to help achieve this. Um, we uh, currently source about 90,000 tonnes, uh, which makes us the largest buyer of sustainable cocoa in the world, about 20% of our supply. And we really call on and, and are working with a number of our competitors to also make a similar long-term global commitment to overhauling the whole industry. Now, that's our work on cocoa, so hopefully that gives you a sense of what we're doing. But we're now systematically going through all of our raw materials, trying to identify what's the mutual solution for us and how can we apply our capabilities. So on fish, we've committed for 100% sustainability, sustainably certified fish by 2020. On milk, mint, we're one of the world's largest mint buyers. We're working to increase yields whilst reducing greenhouse gas impact. On peanuts, we're one of the world's largest peanut buyers for M&Ms and Snickers. We're working to increase productivity whilst also reducing water. And then on palm oil, coffee and tea, we also have a number of sustainable uh, certification uh, goals as well. Now, within sourcing, before I move on, one of the things that we're also trying to do as well is as we build up these capabilities, not just apply them to our own raw materials, but share them more universally. And one of the uh, initiatives that we're particularly proud to be involved in um, uh, is the African Orphan Crops Consortium. And this is a group of um, scientific research organizations and companies such as ourselves that have come together with the ambition of sequencing 100 genomes for the 100 most important orphan crops in Africa. 
And as uh, Jason Clay mentioned earlier, these are crops which are critical to the nutrition and livelihoods of smallholder farmers, in this case in Africa, that because of their small scale on the, uh, I suppose, on the global market, haven't really received the research that they really uh, require. So uh, we're replicating our work on cocoa in terms of mapping the genome, releasing it, and then trying to enable scientists to take this, develop variants, and then push them out into the market so that farmers can increase their yield, have plants that are better adapted to climate adaptation, but also, importantly, have a better nutritional quality as well. So that's our work on sourcing. Let me just talk quickly about our work on operations. So uh, we have a number of factories around the world, and we uh, are really committed to this area. One, because we think we have a much higher degree of control than in other areas of our supply chain. But also, it's a significant part of our total footprint. So just on greenhouse gas emissions, it's about 20% of our impact is, uh, is just from our factories alone. And so what we're doing is we're establishing a series of short, mid, and long-term, or we have short, mid, and long-term on energy use, greenhouse gas emissions, water, and waste. And if I just talk very quickly about greenhouse gas emissions, um, in line with our thinking generationally, what we've committed to is by 2040 um, that we will have zero greenhouse gas emissions from our operations. And just in context, this is a series of, of uh, national and local commitments, and you can see hopefully how ambitious uh, we're being in this space. Um, this calculates to a 3% absolute reduction each year, and then we're mid uh, creating midterm targets along the way. Um, and, and just very briefly, you know, we're, we're, we've established a core set of strategies for how we do this. We work with each factory. We have managers in a, a very structured program, not to only hit the goals, but then also to help them work on operational efficiency, capital efficiency, uh, new technology, and then renewables as well. And we've got a very active program of uh, launching renewable en energy projects around the world, and we have a very full pipeline uh, yet to come. So uh, the last uh, key area is our brands. And so as well as reducing our impact, which really is the emphasis of the last two uh, buckets that you saw, what we um, believe is that we also have the opportunity to use our brands for additional good to take the huge marketing spend that we have and the consumer relationships that we have to really uh, engage consumers and inspire them to support good causes. Now, this is called cause marketing uh, in a number of examples, and it's been around for a while. Um, and we think it's a bit unloved. We think it's a great tool. We think it could be a great tool for mutuality. And if it's designed in the right way, it can really help drive brand performance whilst at the same time also making a significant difference to causes that are being supported. And so um, <clears throat> if I just talk about one example that we're particularly proud of um, that has uh, launched this year and is also uh, available uh, here is our work on whiskers. Now, for those of you that don't have cats or are, uh, aren't aware of this brand, this is one of the world's leading cat food brands. And what Whiskers stands for is we're really trying to, the brand aims to nurture the nature of cats around the world. Um, we've historically focused on the small cats, your cats, um, but we believe one of the key groups of cats in the world that need nurturing is tigers. There's only 3,200 tigers left in the world. And so what we've done is we partnered with WWF and their tiger protection program that for each pack that's bought, uh, we give a day's protection to uh, a tiger in the field through a range of support through conservation and uh, um, uh, looking after them measures. Um, we're very proud to support this with WWF. So far this year, we've donated just in the UK and Ireland 600 million uh, euros, and we hope to scale this in time as well. We also have programs in this uh, in cause marketing uh, on some on a number of our other big global brands as well, such as Pedigree, Uncle Ben's, uh, Wrigley's as well, as well as Maltesers. So just to end uh, and to close, um, I hope you can get a sense from my talk that for us. At Mars, sustainability is more than a passing fad. It's not something that's shallow. It's core to who we are. It's core to how we source, how we make, and increasingly how we sell as well. And we believe it's key to our financial success today, but then also critically as we go into the future. We, th we think it's, it's uh, essential to our and many other businesses' future success. And in particular, as we've gone on this journey, we've found three things that have helped us so far that I just thought I'd, I'd leave you with. First of all, this concept of mutuality, this concept of delivering a benefit to all. 
as we look at many of the problems around the world, we actually, when you, when you begin to think in terms of generations to fix stuff, it makes you realize the level of investment that we're going to need to put into stuff. The only way investments are going to be able to sustain and scale over time is if we figure how the business can, in turn, scale and sustain the investment that's required to resolve the problem. And so we believe in identifying the right thing for people or planet, but at the same time being quite disciplined in where the business case is for us. The second piece is thinking generationally, not just quarterly or even annually. If we can understand the change that we want to make in the end, then it helps us put in context the activities that we need to do now. And in terms of deciding those changes, we think it's critical that we're informed by science. There's an awful lot of opinion in this space. But when we take science and we take the key information and facts, often it helps distill the problem, identify the key things that we need to do. And then if we can apply research and development technology to the problem, it will also help resolve things as well. So I hope this has been useful. And thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions in the Q&A. Many thanks.